So I want to talk today about uh, the complexity of motion planning. So proving hardness results uh, using this new theory of gadgets. And we'll use that to analyze lots of fun video games like uh, Super Mario Brothers here. So let's get started. Um, we, you can think of this about as analyzing video games or analyzing motion planning, uh, depending on whether you're trying to just have fun or uh, view this as more, more serious research. Uh, but the two are connected because video games usually have a protagonist uh, like Mario here, um, who is uh, traversing the environment. Um, and that is essentially a motion planning game for one robot. Uh, and other games have multiple robots and we can get all sorts of interesting problems. We'll see a whole bunch of different motion planning and game problems today. Um, why I like to analyze games is one reason is to try to formalize the notion of a fun game. Um, and it's hard to define what fun is, uh, but a something that's easier to define is challenging. We can formalize a game being challenging as being computationally hard. Um, and humans like a challenge. So one aspect of fun, I think, is challenge. And this is something that we can actually formalize and prove. And the idea is if your game is hard for a computer to play, it's probably hard for a human too, and so challenging. Um, and in the computational complexity world, we have these different uh, complexity classes that I'll be working with today. You don't really need to know what they mean, uh, but it's maybe helpful to know that this is the order of difficulty. So polynomial is the good case where things are easy. Uh, NP completeness is next level up. P space completeness is next level up. And X time completeness is the biggest level we'll be talking about here for the most part. Um, and at, the, at X time, we know that the, the problem it needs exponential time. Um, and in between... Probably it also requires exponential time, but there's some technical differences between them. Uh, and we like to do this to understand the difficulty of these games, um, but it also can lead to new level designs and other fun stuff, and it's fun to do. Um, so we can categorize games in, in this table, which you may have seen some version of before, uh, by the number of players we have at the bottom and whether the number of moves is polynomially bounded or could be uh, unbounded, so usually exponential. Um, and so normally, uh, if you're thinking about a puzzle game, you're thinking about a one-player game, and then you, uh, each of these boxes has a kind of typical complexity class. Uh, so for bounded one-player games, you get lots of NP-complete games like Minesweeper, um, and for unbounded games, you get lots of P-space-complete games like uh, Rush Hour here. Uh, but you can also think about zero players, like uh, Game of Life here, um, or two-player games uh, like Chess and Go are unbounded, and they are X time complete. Or Othello, for example, is P space complete because the number of moves is bounded. Um, and then I won't talk about it too much, but there is a theory of this uh, higher class of games where you have two teams and multiple players on each team, and uh, not everyone knows all the information in the game. Uh, so certain card games and advanced versions of Go have these features, and then you get somewhat higher complexity classes, which I won't really talk about, but uh, they're there. Um, so that's sort of abstract in general. I want to be more concrete and talk about a particular game. One of my, probably my favorite video game ever is Super Mario Brothers, made by Nintendo. It started in Kyoto. Um, and we wrote uh, two papers uh, analyzing the complexity of Super Mario Brothers. This first paper back in 2012 proved NP hardness. Um, and then a few years after that, we proved P space hardness. So let me show you a little bit about what that proof looks like. I'm not going to show you a formal proof, but it's uh, just tell you that it's based on this one picture. This picture is called a gadget. Um, and we use this gadget in lots of different ways to, to prove P-space completeness of Super Mario Brothers. So what does this picture do? It's like a little piece of a Mario Brothers level. Um, and you can, it's on the, shown on the top here. Bottom is just some possible ways you could traverse it. Um, so uh, the way this gadget works is you can come in on this traverse path and walk around here 
and escape. Um, that's called traversing. Uh, but if you want to do the same thing over on the other side, this is the close path, uh, you would die if you touch this spiky monster. And so you, what you end up needing to do is come down here, uh, jump onto this block in a well-timed way to get this spiny onto the other side, and then you will be able to do the closed traversal. And conversely, you can come in this open path and uh, get the spiny back in the other direction if you need to. So that's abstractly what's going on. Let's see it in action. So here we uh, hacked one of the uh, Super Mario Brothers ROM to make sure that we were uh, behaving correctly according to Super Mario Brothers physics. And you can see that it is indeed possible for with a well-timed jump to get the spiny to the other side. And that lets you traverse uh, in those different states. Um, so really what's going on, we call this a door gadget. Um, in the open state, which is what's shown right now, uh, you can do the traverse path. Uh, but if you follow the closed path, you have to switch the spiny to the other side, and then you can't follow the traverse path until you reopen the door. So that's how door works. But we'd like to generalize from this one picture to what is a gadget in general? And there are many possible answers to this question, uh, but we're going to formalize it in this way. We'd like the gadget to be simple, meaning it's a small picture, constant size, and constant number of local states. Uh, we'd like all of the state in the construction to be within a gadget. Uh, so it's each gadget is kind of local. There isn't some long distance communication between different gadgets. Um, and we'd like to be able to traverse these gadgets in different ways. So there's going to be some locations, which we've, we've labeled here, um, and some different uh, traversals between those locations. And when you do those traversals, they may change the state of the gadget. Like we've seen, when you follow the closed path, you are forced to change into the closed state. So let's take this picture of the of the specific Super Mario Brothers gadget, we can abstract it into this very simple picture where we have these different locations at the edges of the gadget. The gadget is just a black box now, or a blue box. Um, and we have these possible traversal paths between the dots. Um, and to make things, um, so we used to draw gadget diagrams like this. This is an early drawing of a door gadget uh, with the idea that there's some state here, which is, is the door open or closed? And this traversal is possible only in the open state. And when we do open, when we follow the open path, we can, if we want, open the door, or maybe we can go the other way. And when we follow the closed path, we must close the door. So that's a nice way to draw it for this particular case. But an easier to generalize view is to draw two different diagrams for the two different states that the gadget can be in. So the gadget could be open. And in the open state, you're allowed to take this traversal path. Or the gadget could be closed. And then you're not allowed to go here. Um, and down at the bottom here, we have the, the open loop. If you do the open loop in the open state, nothing happens. If you do it in the closed loop, um, we we put we write open here to say that you change to the open state when you do that traversal. And similarly, when we do this traversal, we change to the closed state. So this is nice because this is a totally generic way to explain what happens with the door gadget if it's provided all the state is local. Uh, if you have k states, you'll have k little diagrams like this saying what traversals you can do in each state. Um, so just to be explicit, this is the open state of this particular gadget. This is the closed state of this particular gadget. Uh, the top is sort of the implementation of the specification at the bottom. Um, two other features of the specific of door gadgets is that uh, we say that they're on tunnels, meaning that uh, there's just a perfect matching on the locations. Uh, basically. Uh, you, these dots have been paired up and there's either a connection between them or there's no connection between them, but you never change the pairing. Uh, that's a particular type of gadget. You don't have to have that property, but a lot of interesting gadgets have these kinds of tunnels that are either open or closed. Um, and if, uh, if the opening path is forced, uh, then this gadget is also called deterministic. Um, and the, the way I've drawn it here is that when you follow the open path, you must open the gadget. Uh, then 
once I decide that I'm going from location A to location B in a particular state, then it's forced what my new look new uh, state is. Uh, so that's called a deterministic gadget. You don't have to have that property. For example, if it's if you have a choice of either opening or not opening when you follow the open path, then that's a non-deterministic gadget. Okay, but uh, we can generalize the specific door gadget that we're seeing into uh, a few different options. But in general, we want three tunnels, which are the open flows traverse. Um, we're going to allow the open path to be optional or not either way. And we can also make the paths directed or undirected. So maybe you have to follow them in a particular direction or you can go in either direction. So it's a particular, or this is a set of three tunnel, two state gadgets. Originally they were developed to analyze this video game, uh, Lemmings, and then we use them in the Super Mario Brothers proof. Uh, but now we have a whole framework for understanding door gadgets. Um, so let me just define one more. The, the problem we're interested in with door gadgets is I give you a, a network of door gadgets, or we call it a system. So this, these are individual door gadgets here. I'm using the old drawings just so it's easier to follow. And then there's some connections between uh, locations in this kind of graph structure uh, to connect different locations of these gadgets together. And I give you the initial state of each gadget, in this case, uh, open or closed. I give you a start location, I give you a goal location, and I want to know, can I get there? That's the decision problem. Um, and uh, of course, it's more complicated than that little picture. You have a big network of gadgets, and I don't know, can you get from this location to this location? Maybe. Um, and in general, this problem turns out to be P-space complete. For any door gadget you choose, you can make some of the edges directed, some undirected. Uh, you can make op the open path optional or not. Um, and even more useful for analyzing two-dimensional video games is that this problem remains P-space complete when uh, you're dealing with planar motion planning, when all the connections, your graph on the gadgets forms a planar graph. Um, except in one case we don't know. So there are lots of cases that are hard. Uh, if you have any undirected uh, connection, then it's P-space complete. Uh, if you have a mix of undirected or directed, that's cool also. If you have all of the paths are directed um, and you're interested in the planar case, then there are many different ways they could be. Uh, the open path here is green, the closed path is red, and the traverse path is blue. There are many different ways that those could be uh, drawn in a planar way. Or they could be crossing. If they're crossing, it's P-space complete. Every single case except this one case eight uh, is the bane of our existence. That one we can prove is NP-hard, but we don't know whether it's P-space complete. Uh, so the point of all this is you don't need to understand how to do P-space completeness proofs. All you need to do is understand doors. And if you can build any door except case eight, you're done. You've proved that your game is P-space complete. Uh, so this is uh, so here is Super Mario Brothers again. This turns out to be case four if you check how the open and traverse and close are oriented relative to each other. And so that's good. Uh, that works. Uh, if you look at the original proof we published for P-space completeness, we gave a complete reduction. It's much more complicated. There was a whole other gadget called a crossover gadget, which I won't get into here, uh, but that's no longer needed. You no longer need this complicated proof. You just need the store gadget. That one gadget is enough to prove the whole game is hard. Um, we, in an earlier paper, we also analyzed Donkey Kong Country, one, two, and three. Uh, each of them, we gave a door gadget. Uh, we also gave a crossover gadget. We don't need that anymore. These all turn out to be the good case. None of them are the bad case eight. Uh, Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, we also gave an a internal crossing door. And so that one gadget is enough to prove proof of space completeness of that game. So lots of proofs, old proofs, simplify with this gadget door gadget framework. Here's a brand new proof, uh, which will appear at this conference. Um, so this is an advertisement to check out our Legend of Zelda uh, new results talk, Legend of Zelda Complexity of Mechanics, I believe is the title. Uh, so this is a particular mechanic uh, called mag Magnetic Gloves, which I won't get into, but we built a case nine door. And so uh, it's P-space complete. Uh, here's a nice um, sort of pushing block type 
uh, game called Soko Bond. Different from Soko Bond, uh, if you know that game, it's very famous. Uh, Soko Bond is a version where uh, your objects can be bonded together. So this is like one rigid object. And the idea is you can come in this open path, push this down one, and then leave. And the whole structure will shift down by one step. And so then it will be possible to do this uh, left to right traverse path. And conversely, if I come in this closed path, I will have to push this up one and the, in order to leave out the close out. And so I'll reset the gadget to its original state. So this is a door. So this game is piece space complete. Very easy proof. Um, there are other variations on the door gadget. So here's a kind of a simpler door gadget called a self-closing door, where I just add this extra connection from traverse out to close in. So whenever I traverse an open door, I force myself to also close it. This should be a simpler gadget to build, uh, modulo planarity. And sometimes this is a simpler gadget to build. Um, and we, uh, any, if you can build that gadget, you also get piece-based completeness. Here's one context where we used it uh, this is actually the last JCDC GGG. Um, and uh, pulling blocks is the game. You can see it executing in the top here. So here, you're a little one by one agent, um, and you can pull blocks instead of pushing blocks. And in fact, you must pull. So when this little robot uh, comes over here, it's forced to pull the block to the right. Okay, that's called pull exclamation mark. And there's fixed blocks, and you have a strength of one. You can have gravity or not, doesn't matter. Uh, then you can build this self closing, very simple self closing door here on the bottom. Uh, so if I come in here, I can pull this block uh, to the right one, and I get the state on the right. And then it will be possible to come down through here. And when I do so, I pull this block to the left, and the door self closes because we're in forced pull land. Uh, this would work in the video game um, Baba is You, for example, where you have first pulse. Uh, and so there, there's one application of self-closing doors. Uh, there's a, another application in the, the new Legend of Zelda paper, which you can check out. Uh, here, the idea is that to traverse, I have to pick up this platform and move it over here. And when I do that, I won't be able to traverse again. So that's self-closing. And there's some other way to come through here and uh, pick up this object kind of remotely and bring it over here. If you've played Breath of the Wild, this will make sense. If you haven't, watch the talk. Um, and even kind of cooler version of the self-closing door is what we call the symmetric self-closing door. So here we do the same thing. So the self-close path was had the property you could traverse it when the door is open, and when you do so, it closes the door. So now we're going to have a symmetric self-open, which is you can only do it if the door is closed, and when you do so, you open the door. So now, actually, open and close are completely symmetric. They don't necessarily have to correspond to doors anymore. There's just two states, and in state, in state one, you can follow path one, and in state two, you can follow path uh, two, and when you, whenever you follow one of these paths, you switch states. So a very simple kind of gadget. And it turns out all of these uh, doors are P-space complete, uh, even in the planar case, even when you connect them together without crossings. Uh, so both symmetric and asymmetric doors. So you can use this to, again, prove lots of games P-space complete. Here's um, uh, one called Super Mario Sunshine, a 3D Mario game. Uh, don't need to know the how this game works, but the idea is you can come on here, get on this lily pad, and float across to the other side and park the lily pad right here so that later uh, you'll be able to come here and take it to the other side and park it over there. And so you're just alternating between these two states, one where you can go up on the left and the other where you can go down on the right. And you need, with some one-way protection, that gives you symmetric self-closing door. Um, here's an example of actually implementing this using a, uh, a monster called Booze, where you write it across uh, quicksand. And lots, you can apply this to many different games. Uh, Super Mario Odyssey, that's the latest Mario game. Uh, lots of different games get proved hard with this single framework. Um, I'll mention before I move on from doors, uh, next topic is general gadgets. Uh, 
a, one of the first video games involving opening and closing doors is called, appropriately enough, Door Door. Um, Ruhe recommended this to me. Um, and it's a game where you open doors in order to trap monsters. So a different, different mechanism here, but doors do have state, uh, which is whether they have yet trapped a monster. When they have, uh, they cannot be used again. So this might be a bounded game, but uh, I think to analyze this game, you really need to understand how the monsters move. That seems the, the real state in the game is where are the monsters currently, and they track you seemingly according to some greedy algorithm. And that, I think, might make the game piece space complete, even with a single door. That would be my conjecture. But, but if you get bored during this talk, uh, please prove that this problem is hard. We might be able to use the frameworks that I'm about to tell you in order to analyze this game, but we haven't played with it much yet. Okay, so let me tell you the now the broader gadget framework. Doors were just one, well, actually there were like three different types of examples of gadgets. Um, here's maybe an, another very simple gadget. It's called the locking two toggle. Just to illustrate the, the general idea is that a gadget just consists of some finite set of locations, some finite set of states, and some allowed transitions saying in this location and this state, I can transition to this other location and this state. Uh, but let's walk through that in a particular example that turns out to be important. So uh, the, the diagram here is this one. There are three states for this gadget. This is our first three state gadget. Very exciting. We start in this neutral state. And if the robot comes in here and traverses one of these arrows, it has to be in the correct direction indicated by the arrow. Then we, we move to this state, in this case, uh, this one, where uh, the only thing we, we can do is go back along the path that we just came. So this one closes up, uh, and then we, uh, if we go back across, then that top edge resets. If we later come across the top edge, the gadgets are remembering what the last edge is that we used, and then we have to undo that move before we're able to do anything again. So it kind of locks into one state or the other. Um, so now the general problem, just like with doors, is I give you a network of these gadgets, I give you an initial state for each of the gadgets, um, and I want to know, can I go from state from some start point to some end point um, while respecting all like doing valid gadget traversals using also there's like these graph connections between the different gadget locations. Okay, um, so it turns out door gadgets are actually really significant in the growing theory of gadgets uh, because they are universal. In some sense, they are the most interesting gadgets out there, at least for one player on Bounded Games. Um, and that you can use any single door gadget to simulate any to simulate all other gadgets. Uh, so there's a general construction, which is depicted here, but I'm not going to go through the details, to build any gadget you care about. For example, locking two toggle can be built out of any specific door gadget, uh, possibly with crossings. But uh, So that's door gadgets are kind of at the upper extreme of complexity. And it turns out locking two toggles are at the lower extreme, but I want to get to that. Uh, so we defined what, a gadget, what it means for a gadget to be on tunnels. Um, and also deterministic. Uh, I want to define one more concept, uh, one more sort of extra feature a gadget might have, which is reversibility, um, which is that any action you do on a gadget can immediately be undone. So if you don't do any other traversals on that gadget, um, you can always do the opposite traversal of what you had before. Um, so uh, there's lots of motivation for reversibility. There's a whole theory of reversible computing. Originally, we were interested in these push-pull block puzzles where you can push and pull blocks. And so everything was naturally reversible. Um, and some of you may know constraint logic. This also has a reversible reversibility. Um, so it's, just, it's an interesting class of gadgets to, to think about. Um, so uh, why do I care about all those terms? Well, it turns out you can characterize exactly when motion planning is through a bunch of gadgets is p-space complete if you restrict to reversible deterministic tunnel gadgets. So those three terms we just saw. Uh, it turns out motion planning is p-space complete if and only if uh, at least one of your gadgets has uh, a property called interacting tunnels, uh, which all the gadgets we've seen so far do, because they're p-space complete, um, which is that when I traverse some tunnel, I affect the traversability of some other tunnel. So for example, when I do this top traversal, 
I prevent traversability of this bottom traversal. Um, it turns out if you have any gadget with that property, it can simulate the locking two toggle. So locking two toggle is kind of the minimal gadget in a certain sense, or a minimal gadget. There might be others um, in that every gadget can be simulated by a door and can simulate a locking two toggle if you restrict to this reversible deterministic tunnel case. Um, so if you have just one gadget with this property, the problem is hard, and otherwise the problem is polynomial. So uh, the same thing is true if I add uh, planar as an adjective. Uh, just the same theorem. So this is great for 2D games. Uh, for example, another one from Zelda in this minecart world, uh, you can build a locking two toggle and therefore the game is piece space complete. Let's see uh, tomorrow's talk for details. Um, or uh, we can use it for a different pulling blocks game. This is optional pulls where you get to pull or not. You get to choose uh, where you have a strength of two and fixed blocks and maybe gravity. Um, so here uh, we build something called a one toggle. This is another gadget, useful gadget to know about. Very simple. It just has a single traversal path. And in, in one state, you can only traverse it to the left. And when you do so, you switch to the other side. So we call it a toggle. Um, and then when you're in the right state, you can only go to the right. And when you do so, you switch to the left state. So uh, that's what's being executed by this gadget here. Um, you, once you traverse it, you're forced to traverse it in the other direction next time. And then you see that gadget uh, plugged in here and plugged in here. Um, so that's, uh, and this builds kind of a locking two toggle. Uh, sometimes you don't literally get gadgets that you know how to prove are hard. In this case, we get a slightly less deterministic version where um, when you traverse it, you need to set things up for the next traversal. Uh, but it turns out you can prove that's also hard uh, with a little bit more work. So sometimes you need to do a little bit of work, but uh, for the most part, you're just drawing one diagram, which is your gadget and showing that that's hard. Um, but this idea of plugging in one toggles actually turns out to also be seem to be pretty important. We've used it in a couple of papers now. So this is the idea of one toggle protected. So this is exactly the same setup. But now, uh, whenever I have a connection between two gadgets, I'm always going to put a one toggle on that gadget. So what what or on that edge connection. Uh, so what this means is if any connection between gadgets, you have to essentially alternate directions. Uh, so this is an extra constraint. It might make the problem easier or harder. Turns out it's exactly the same. So adding in these one toggles, everything's still still hard. Um, in this case, because um, we're only allowing single edge connections between gadgets now, we also need this so-called branching hallway gadget, which just says you can go between any of these three connections. So just a way to get the branching in the connections. OK, um, so why did I tell you all this? Because we use it in um, to analyze this uh, real world motion planning problem, which is you have modular robots, a bunch of cubes. Each one can rotate around the others. They do this with a flywheel. It's really cool. Um, and these magnets to hold on. And so you want to reconfigure uh, n of these modular robots from one configuration to another. Turns out, sadly, uh, deciding whether that's possible is P space complete. And it's this really beautiful, elaborate um, gadget. But again, it is a locking two toggle uh, that's one toggle protected. Um, and you can also build a branching hallway. And so this problem is piece space complete. Uh, it's a new, new result. Um, you can do the same thing with hexagons in a particular model. Uh, so I want to tell you about another game, uh, which is called Subway Shuffle, or it's implemented in this physical version called Athena. Uh, this is uh, invented by a former student of mine, Bob Hearn, uh, which if you know the game, the book Games, Puzzles, and Computation, uh, that was his thesis. Um, so here we have these tokens, they have colors, and there's these paths that are also colored, and you're only allowed to move tokens along the same color path. And here you want to get a particular car to a particular destination or traverse. Yeah. Uh, so this this game was unsolved for a long time. Um, but recently, we uh, there's one group that proved a particular type of P-space hardness. And we recently proved a much stronger version uh, where even if you just have two colors of, of tracks for the trains, uh, this is a subway subway game and just these two vertex types so the colors here are orange and purple um, 
and you just have a single hole where you can move trains into. Um, and you also have directions on the edges and it's planar. In all, all of these constraints, still the game is piece space complete. Um, and you can interpret that as a gadget result. Um, so this is a, the first example of a gadget that's not on tunnels. So here uh, there are three uh, different locations. And this is what you would get if you took a locking two toggle and then fused together two of the locations uh, because we had the, these two here. Before these were separate. So when I did this traversal, the next thing I had to do was the opposite. Or if I do this traversal, the next thing I have to do is the opposite. But I just fuse these together. So this is kind of a simpler version of the locking two toggle. Uh, by itself, it's not hard. But if you also add this kind of branching hallway gadget, um, sorry, by itself, we don't know whether this is hard. Uh, but to these two together, we can prove are hard. Um, and we don't actually prove this using the gadget framework, at least currently. Uh, but it's another gadget result. And it's a motion planning result. So I'll tell you about some of the consequences, which are pretty cool. Um, so one consequence is that uh, this, the original motivation for introducing Subway Shuffle was to analyze one by one rush hour. So you know rush hour, you've got these cars. They can either go horizontally or vertically. Um, two perpendicular directions. And normally, uh, they're like one by two or one by three cars. But what if you just have these one by one cars and they're labeled whether they can move horizontally or vertically? Uh, well, then um, you can simulate subway shuffle. As long as you only have two colors, um, then you only have two tracks meeting and you can always arrange for them to meet perpendicularly. Um, just by routing edges along like this. So as long as you allow fixed blocks, things that can't move, uh, and you just have a single hull, then subway shuffle over here will work exactly like one by one rush hour over here. Uh, so you can prove that piece space complete. Uh, another fun problem is uh, chess helpmate. So this is regular chess, well, regular, end by end chess with lots of pieces uh, and two players white and black. And now they're cooperating in order to get uh, a checkmate. Uh, so let's say for white to get a checkmate. Um, so that turns out to be piece space complete. Uh, it's essentially a one player game because the two players are cooperating. And there's this great rule in official FIDE chess, which says that if it's impossible from the current game state uh, for one player to get a checkmate, uh, then the game is declared a draw. So that turns out. So what this means is that uh, maybe I should say draw in zero here uh, to decide whether the game is already drawn is piece space complete. <laughs> so never mind playing any moves, just like knowing whether, according to this rule, the game is already drawn. Uh, it's, it's super hard. And again, this is by implementing uh, these subway shuffle vertices. Okay. Um, so you've seen lots of different gadgets. Uh, one hope might be to kind of characterize all possible gadgets within some set. So here's an attempt to do that. Let's just think about two state gadgets. So that's relatively simple. And let's restrict to tunnels. Then there's actually only three different uh, tunnel types you can have. We've seen the toggle. The toggle has a feature that when I traverse it in one direction, it uh, reverses with what direction is allowed. We've seen some something I'll call a lock. This is like a door. Uh, the traverse part of a door. In one state, you can traverse it. In the other state, you can't. Um, and a third thing we haven't really seen is a tripwire. This is something you can traverse in either direction at, all the time. And whenever you do, it switches the state of the gadget. So if, uh, according, if you remove certain trivial cases, this is all you can have. And then, for example, if you want to look at two states, uh, two tunnel, uh, reversible deterministic gadgets. Oh, I forgot to say this was assuming reversible and deterministic. Um, then there are really only four things you can have. You can have a toggle and a lock. You can have a tripwire and a lock, a tripwire and a toggle, or two toggles together. Um, and here I've drawn three different planar ways to draw toggles, but they're all they're all two toggles. Um, so this is like a little menagerie of certain uh, complete characterization of certain gadgets. Um, and before, in the general case, I was saying, well, doors are the most powerful and locking two toggles are the least powerful. Uh, it turns out in this world, everything is equally powerful. Uh, so you can show that every gadget in this family can simulate ev every other, as long as they have two non-trivial tunnels like this. Uh, so that's kind of neat. These are all equal power. 
Um, the way you prove that, by the way, is just by drawing more gadget diagrams. So this is a way to build a particular gadget uh, as a, via this big sequence of, of conversions uh, in terms of other gadgets. Uh, so it's just more gadget proofs all the way down. Um, originally, we used this to prove a certain push-pull game is P-Space hard, although that result has since been improved. This here, we were building a two-toggle. Um, more interesting uh, is these four spinners in yet another version of Legend of Zelda. Uh, so this is in Oracle of Seasons. And in this, uh, the way these four spinners work is you can, they're either blue or red. In the blue state, uh, I believe you go counterclockwise. So when Link comes in here, uh, he can leave out in this direction. And then they switch to the red state. And if you come back in, in the red state, uh, you end up going clockwise. So this is a reversible deterministic gadget. Uh, and it turns out you can use it uh, to simulate two toggles, and therefore it's piece pace hard. Um, uh, from just C from CCCG just a couple weeks ago, uh, these are some new results showing that certain types of turn styles are hard. So uh, what's the simplest case to draw? Maybe this one. So turn style, these yellow and blue things. So when I move along the turn style in this direction, it flips to this other state. Um, and it turns out uh, with that particular type of turnstile, you can build an anti-parallel locking two toggle. It's really useful to have words for all these gadgets. You just try mushing your things together and see what type of gadget behavior you get. And if it's one of the ones on the list that's known to be P-Space complete, we're, we're done. Um, and you can similarly prove hardness for um, different shapes of turnstiles and use this to prove uh, Super Mario Odyssey and Pokemon Ruby and Quirk are all P-Space complete. Uh, next puzzle I want to talk about is Tilt. Uh, tilt is a game where you have a bunch of one-by-one -one pieces, and when you s tilt the board, all the pieces move maximally in a particular direction. So this is, I think of it as this puzzle, but it's actually a practical problem where you, um, you can build this in real life with cells embedded with iron and big magnets on the outside. You turn on the big magnets and those cells will move maximally in a given direction. And so you can use this to, from the outside, control uh, complicated little things, say, in a vascular network. And they move around and you want to get them to different locations. So this is a real world problem. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the problems here are piece space complete, so hard to solve. Uh, here's one version. Um, this is uh, tilt assembly, where you want to arrange some movable blocks within some fixed blocks uh, into a particular kind of built uh, structure. So this would be like 3D printing uh, at the nano scale using these big global controls. Uh, here's a slight variation of tilt where uh, it's called uniform control signals. There's a paper about that model in this uh, TJCGCGGG, um, where when you say everyone go to the right, they actually only go to the right one step. Um, and here you can prove also that a particular problem is P-space hard. Again, all of this is using gadget theory. Here we're building a crossing toggle lock. So that's why we like collecting all these hard gadgets. All right, um, so the, the, the first big paper uh, that developed this gadget theory is this one. Um, I think maybe it's now toward a general theory of motion planning complexity. Um, and what we just talked about is this one cell, um, which is the unbounded case, uh, one player games. Uh, but we actually also did two player games and bounded games and team games. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about the other cases too. We usually focus in on this case, but let's go to polynomially bounded uh, one player game. So um, I'm going to tell you about a different type of gadget, no longer the reversible deterministic special case, a different special case uh, called DAGs uh, or acyclic gadgets. So here the idea is I, I just abstract, uh, I look at the different states that my gadget could be in, I think of those as nodes in a graph, and I'm going to connect them via edges if it's possible to start in this state and end in this state. And so I get this graph. And if that graph is acyclic, uh, then I call it a DAG gadget. Um, and this means that the gadget is naturally bounded. Uh, the number of transitions you can do, I mean, once you get down to one of these sync nodes, you can't do any more transitions, you're done. So the number of transitions is less than the number of states. Uh, so this is actually a particular gadget of interest called the, a distant opening gadget. So here, when I traverse this edge, I open some other traversal. 
That's called a distant opening. Just in some, from some state, it's possible to open some other traversal. Another useful DAG gadget is called forced distant closing. This is sort of the opposite. There's some traversal I do that closes another traversal from some state. In this case, this one I drew symmetrically, so left or right uh, closes the opposite path, uh, but it doesn't have to be that. It could just be one of those. Uh, it turns out this is a characterization of the hard DAG gadgets. So in, in this setting, we're interested in MP completeness because these games are naturally bounded and for one player. Um, motion planning is MP complete if and only if you have one of these two cases, either a distant opening or a forced distant closing. Defining those precisely is a little tricky, but if you have one of those, your game is hard. Otherwise, it's polynomial. So this is nice. It's again, an exact characterization, and you can use it uh, to analyze lots of games. To analyze games, it's useful to generalize. This is the definitions I had before. Now I'm going to change it slightly and add this L, which means we also allow loops. Uh, so we, in this case, we're going to allow at the end, for example, to all, for all these traversals to just remain open uh, without the state changing. So we're going to add loops to the some of the sync nodes. Um, here we don't have a complete characterization. We just have a hardness if one of these two cases happens. Um, and in this case, we also need a one-way gadget uh, where there's some directed traversal. Um, one cool thing is that if you have a forced distant closing gadget uh, and you allow even allowing loops, we can prove that the planar problem is hard. Sadly, for the uh, opening case, we need a crossover gadget. Okay, I just this is the general case. Let me show you some examples. So before we proved Super Mario Brothers was P-Space hard, we proved it NP hard. We had all these different gadgets. Uh, it turns out via this theory, you need only about half of them. Uh, this turns this alone turns out to build a directed door opening. Uh, for this particular proof, we need a crossover. We know for P-Space hardness, we don't need that, but the hardness we do. Uh, or we prove here are some other games. For example, Metroid over here is a game Nintendo game we haven't talked about yet. Uh, we built a clause and a crossover gadget in our old proof. Now we just need this much smaller piece of the original gadget. Our work would have been a lot easier if we had this theory. We can now just um, build much, much simpler gadgets. Probably most dramatic is this proof that basically all versions of Pokemon are NP hard. Um, we had this very complicated crossover gadget and this variable gadget. And now it turns out this gadget is enough to prove NP hardness because it does door closing. And then we know planar motion planning is hard. So you don't need to cross over and it's very cool. So cleaning up lots of existing proofs. Um, one, the first NP hardness proof I did, I think, is this push one uh, puzzle where you can push one block, one, one space at a time. Um, and we built all these different gadgets because we didn't know what we were doing, uh, essentially, or trying to come up with uh, uh, hardness proof directly from 3SAT, which is much harder. And it turns out this one gadget we built called NAND gadget is a door closing gadget. It has a door, force, uh, door closing property. So that alone is enough to prove NP hardness. Once we realize this, uh, we've used it for other proofs. So here is a pulling blocks result, uh, a bit more of a complicated gadget, but it builds one of these NAND gadgets, and therefore it's NP-hard. Uh, so that was the bounded case, a little tour of that. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the two-player. How do you generalize this gadgets to two players? Uh, well, the idea is you have two different robots, or you have one, one robot per player, and the players are going to take turns, and a turn is doing one gadget transition. This seems like the natural way to generalize this to two players. Uh, each player also has their own goal. Whoever gets to their goal first wins. Uh, so with two players, the complexities increase. So first, let me tell you about the bounded case. So if we're thinking about DAG gadgets, uh, for two players, we expect to get P-space completeness. And this happens uh, if and only if. So again, we get an exact characterization of when this works um, in a broader case than what we had before. Uh, before we had the forced um, forced opening of forced distant closing. Um, now it's enough for just any gadget to do anything interesting. Uh, this would be non-trivial. Uh, so just any traversal affects some traversal, possibly including itself. So very a much weaker property for two players suffices for hardness. The two canonical gadgets here are um, the 
single use directed edge. Uh, so here I can traverse this edge and then it disappears. I call this a crumbling edge, crumbler, um, or an edge that can be traversed in either direction. And after you traverse it, it's gone. So these, just having single use edges like this, it turns out every DAG gadget that's not trivial can simulate one of these two. And they those are enough to be piece space complete. And otherwise your problem is polynomial. Uh, for example, you can use this to simplify a Mario Kart hardness proof. Um, so uh, this was our old proof. This is uh, from JCDCGGG 2015, maybe Kyoto. Um, and uh, it was you know, a more complicated proof. Our new proof is this one gadget, which is uh, you have a little mushroom power up that lets you jump over uh, a space. And once that mushroom power up is gone, you're going to slow down or fall down into another area of the map. Um, and so that's a directed single use edge. And that's enough for piece of completeness. So you can see this really cleans up a lot of, a lot of existing proofs. Um, and then the other version of two player is the unbounded case. So the natural thing here would be reversible deterministic tunnel gadgets, and we'd like them to be X time complete. But here we don't have a complete characterization. All we know is that if you have interacting tunnels, just like in the one player case, that's enough for hardness. Uh, but for like the single use gadgets, we don't know whether that's enough for hardness. So there's a gap here. But we haven't solved everything. Uh, for team motion planning, it's a similar story. In the bounded case, we have an if and only if condition. And in the unbounded case, we just have an if condition. Um, but sort of the similar things work. The reason why this is sort of easy, relatively easy for us is all of these proofs are based on constraint logic. And all the hard work was for like team motion planning was done for constraint logic. And all of that kind of carries over to uh, the motion planning results with enough work. Um, so that was an overview of this paper. Um, but if you look back at the table I showed you, there's one case we haven't talked about yet. And in the last five minutes or so, I want to tell you about what about zero players? Uh, can we do interesting things with gadgets with zero players? What's a zero player game? It's, it's a simulation. It's just where it just it goes. And the, the question you're interested in is to predict uh, what will happen at the end of the simulation, which might take a really long time. So that can be piece space complete, like predicting what will happen uh, a long time in the future in Game of Life is piece space complete. Um, so here, it, this is a, a newer paper um, that tries to get at the zero player gadget framework. And we're going to introduce a different class of gadgets. Uh, called input output gadgets. So this is a different constraint, similar to reversibility, deterministic, or whatever. Uh, but it's none of those. Uh, we want to be able to partition the locations on this gadget into two sets, inputs and outputs. And I'm always going to draw inputs on the left and outputs on the right. And we want all traversals to be directed. And they have to start at an input and end at an output. You can never go from an output to anything else and never go from an input to an input. Uh, so then if you restrict to, uh, well, no, uh, if you restrict to two state gadgets, then there are five different pieces you can use and you can stack as many of these as you want in a gadget. Um, you could have a traversal that when you do it sets you to the up state. We're going to call the two states up and down. Uh, you could have a, a good friend, the toggle that whenever you traverse it, it switches states between up and down. Uh, but we get some interesting things because we're no longer on tunnels now. Uh, with a switch, if you're already in the up state, then you're going to follow this path uh, and not change the state. If you're in the down state, you're going to follow this path and the state won't change. Or you could have something like a toggle switch, which is the same thing. But when you traverse it, you also switch states. You also switch to the down state. And there's another variation called the setup switch. Uh, but that's all you can have with two state gadgets, at least. Um, so... Uh, there's one case that's been studied a lot. Uh, this was one of the motivations for this work. It's called Arrival. Um, this is, uh, you can build this with a lot of train track systems where whenever you first come in here, if you're in the up state, you go up this way, but then you switch to the down state. And the next time you come in, you go on the down path and then you switch. And the next time you come in, it will be up. And the next time you come in, it'll be down and so on. You can build examples that uh, where it takes exponential time to get from some start to the end. Uh, and this is completely deterministic. Uh, there's no choices here. You just run the simulation. Um, 
And so this is an example of what we call a single input input output gadget because there's only one input port here. There's two output ports. And prior work shows that these games are probably not NP complete um, because they're in NP intersect co NP or an even smaller class called UP intersect co UP. There's some sub exponential algorithms. So it seems like this game is weird and interesting. And what we did is generalize that to um, to lots of this. This result holds for all zero player single input input output gadgets. Um, and you can also uh, analyze these in a one player and two player settings. You get some similar results. There's some gaps here, um, but uh, yeah, interesting stuff. What I'm really excited about is the multi input case though. So here, imagine a gadget like this where we have two different things you can do with it. Uh, this is a switch and a set up uh, line. And so you can combine these in all sorts of different ways. And it turns out here we can get a complete characterization of what, when input output gadgets are hard. Uh, let's focus in maybe on the zero player case. Uh, so the trivial case is something like this gadget where you do the traversal and nothing happens. Okay, that turns out to be really easy. Um, polynomial, no surprise. Um, another version uh, in the bounded case, a gadget is going to be bounded if all you're doing, if, if you always move towards a particular state. So in, in this gadget, for example, um, we will always move towards up. Because if I follow this traversal, uh, this notation means we set to the up state. And if I follow this traversal, because it was down, um, okay, maybe we don't yet go up, uh, but uh, eventually we'll go to up and then we'll always be forced to make this traversal. Um, in this example, uh, when we make this traversal, we'll also go to up. And when we make this traversal, we'll go to up. So these are naturally bounded because after you've gotten to the up state, you can't do any more transitions um, in that with that gadget. And it turns out every gadget, uh, every multi-input output gadget that's um, bounded um, can simulate one of these two gadgets like these are the two we call it now calling it a, the basic a basis of gadgets so these are kind of the simplest gadgets in this space and all of them give you p completeness and then more exciting is the unbounded case and there you get p space completeness so as long as you have multiple non-trivial inputs that do something and don't don't fall into this bounded case where things always move towards up or always move towards down then you're guaranteed to get p space completeness and in the one player case, uh, there's some slight changes, but in particular, this, this one becomes MP complete. So uh, we can use this to analyze games because that's what we like to do. Um, I'll just mention that there are three different games we've proved P space complete, uh, three different simulations. So this, the games usually involve building a level. Um, and here, what we're showing is that just checking whether you successfully solved the level, so just running the simulation to see whether it does what you claim it does, is P-Space Complete. So there's a fun app called TrainYard, another one called The Sequence, and there's a game called Factorio, which involves building computers, so it's certainly P-Space Complete. But even the train system or the transportation system of stuff um, are P-Space Complete by building uh, one of the, these gadgets that I described. Oh, so that was a big tour of lots of cool gadget stuff. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I, you use gadgets to uh, prove your problems hard. Anything involving motion planning with an agent, I think this, this gadget theory is super useful. We're still developing it, still finding more gadgets. In particular, uh, there's a team of students that um, grew out of this class, Algorithmic Lower Bounds, which you can fund with hardness proofs which you can watch the uh, videos online. It doesn't cover gadget theory in video form yet, uh, but there are some slides, uh, updates that tell you about gadget theory. Um, and that's all. Thanks.